Hi there, I'm Mike Lindsay. Thank you for viewing my channel. We are going to be talking about blisters. What makes them form? How do we treat them? How to tape your feet to prevent them? But first, we're going to start in a direction that you probably didn't expect. With this guy. George Washington, well known for being the first president of the United States and doppelganger to the actress Glenn Close. But what we are interested in for today's talk is not how he lived, but how he died. Now we don't actually know for sure what he had, as it's been debated now for hundreds of years, but it was almost certainly some sort of infection. His doctors at the time wrote a couple of possible diagnoses, such as inflammatory quincy, which means an abscess in his throat that can block the airway. He very likely could have had something called epiglottitis, which is an infection of the epiglottis. Let me just show you. This is netters, which most medical students learn anatomy on. And this is a crudely drawn picture of a human head, which most YouTubers without copyright licenses teach on. In a dark room wearing a welding helmet, you can hardly tell the difference. That purple piece of construction paper represents the epiglottis, which is responsible for protecting the airway. As we swallow, it covers up to keep food from going in our trachea. I'll illustrate with this popcorn. Nom 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 nom. And you can see here that if that epiglottis was swollen and affected, well, that would make it quite hard to breathe. But what I'm more interested for for this talk is what they did to him. You see, if the infection didn't kill him, then the doctors did. They thought back then that disease was caused by an imbalance in one of the four humors, which was black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. So they proceeded to remove some of these humors to restore the balance. In other words, they bled him. They bled him quite a bit, actually. 80 ounces, or roughly two and a quarter liter. For reference, there's only about 170 ounces of blood in the entire human body. That's about five liters or so. So George Washington lost about 40% of his entire blood volume. And if that's not enough, they also gave him enemas and made him vomit by having him drink something called calomel, which is mercury chloride. We now know a few things. First, that mercury is toxic. And secondly, that forcing people to vomit usually does more harm than it does good. And then the last thing they did to him was blister him. The thought process back then was something along the lines of by causing inflammation on one part of the body by blistering, you're removing inflammation from another part of the body. This logic has been widespread for millennia. Hippocrates prescribed blistering agents for the same reasons. Even more interesting is how they blistered patients. They used Beetlejuice. Oh yeah, here I come, baby. No, not like the fictional character. Literal Beetlejuice from blister beetles. The medical term for a blistering agent is called a vesicant. And the vesicant found in blister beetles is called cantharidin. Cantharidin is really important from an agricultural standpoint because livestock sometimes eat large enough amounts to become poisoned by it. Even if you've never heard of cantharidins, there is one blister beetle you probably have heard of, and that's Spanish fly. That's right, that little bottle that you see for sale on the shelf of shady gas stations promising to lift your libido, that's a vesicant. It causes blisters, which is why your gas station pick-me-up is actually unlikely to contain real Spanish fly, or if it does, it's probably infinitesimal amounts, because the side effects are horrible. Before I start reading the side effects, I'm gonna crank up the baby making music a little bit. Feel free to dim the lights at home. Chemical burns, dysphagia, that's difficulty swallowing, nausea, hematemesis, that's vomiting up blood, hematuria, that's urinating blood, dysuria, that's painful urination, all sorts of kidney abnormalities, Priapism, that's an abnormal erection that can lead to ischemia and you end up with erectile dysfunction. Seizures, cardiac abnormalities. So it's not shocking that the FDA withdrew its approval of this in 1962. And now that I've somehow managed to link George Washington with abnormal erections and blisters, Let's now just focus on blisters. I've been a race physician for ultra marathons, for adventure races, for obstacle course races. From my experience, people still don't have a very good understanding of blisters, particularly what makes them form. But blisters don't have to be nature's way of telling you to choose a new sport. It doesn't matter if you get blisters because you're running or you're hiking or you're skiing or you're going to the gym. It's the same factors that make blisters. When I ask most people how blisters form, they'll say by rubbing or by friction. And while there is truth to that, it's not the whole picture. I could take my finger and rub it back and forth on my arm for several hours and it's unlikely to form a blister. So let's talk about what does form blisters. I got blisters on my fingers. So number one, you need movement. Whenever you take a step, there's a lot of movement that occurs around your foot. Your foot itself shifts within your sock and your sock has to slide within your shoe. Number two, you have to have a point of pressure. Now this could be the result of ill-fitting shoes or if you're like me, you just have weird shaped feet. When your shoes don't fit well, you'll tend to have one part of your shoe that's pressing in on one part of your foot. 
We also develop pressure points when we get dirt and gravel inside our shoes. Number three is a bone that's close to the skin, which means the only place on your foot you're actually likely to develop a blister is this part, because basically the entire thing is a shallow bone. Which brings us to number four. Friction. To understand the role friction plays, let's look at what's happening with this model. Let's just pretend this is a cross section of our big toe. The ball represents the bone, the rubber layer is the outer layer of the skin, and the cloths in between are the tissues under the skin. Our skin layers are held in place by adhesions. First, let's see what happens when we try to move the model against a pressure point with a lot of friction. When this happens, the tissues distort. When this distortion happens repeatedly, the adhesions become torn and the layers separate to make a cavity. Anytime there is an open cavity in the human body, it tends to get filled with a clear liquid, but you may ask where does the blister fluid actually come from? Let's look at the microscopic blood vessels in the body called capillary beds. Whenever there is an injury, these tiny blood vessels dilate and send more blood to the injured area. They also become more leaky and some of the clear fluid and the blood starts to seep out. This is called serous fluid, and it's a filtrated version of blood plasma. Another way to think of it is that some of you viewing this channel were donating blister fluid in college in order to get beer money. At this point, I think it's worth noting that occasionally that blister fluid does get infected. The actress Hilary Swank got an infected blister while filming a million dollar baby and almost had to be hospitalized. Let's do this again, but this time with low friction. Now the skin just slides without distortion. No distortion means no tearing of the adhesions, and since the adhesions remain intact, no blister form. Now, how do we stop blisters? One option is to strengthen your skin. This is what happens when you gradually increase in an exercise. You literally toughen your skin. At the beginning of ski season every year, I tape my feet so I don't get blisters. But by the end of the season, I no longer need to tape my feet. This is because the skin that has been rubbing is now stronger. This is a large part of the reason experienced runners don't blister easily. Number two, you can remove those pressure points. You can do this by finding shoes that fit better. You can also try to modify your shoe. This can mean several different things. For instance, putting in inserts, it could mean covering an irritating seam with duct tape. Always keep dirt and gravel out of your shoe as this can cause pressure points. You'll often see adventure racers running with gaiters over their shoes to keep out debris. Number three, you can decrease the friction and there are several options for doing this. The most obvious way is to apply a lubricant like Vaseline. Some options decrease friction by decreasing the moisture. We tend to think of moisture as making things more slippery, such as someone slipping on a wet floor or sliding in our car when it rains. It may seem counterintuitive, but a lot of surfaces become more sticky when they're moist. We measure friction by something called the coefficient of friction, and the higher the number, the higher the friction. If you look at a graph of the coefficient of friction versus moisture for fabrics such as your socks, you will see that as things become more moist, they develop more friction. The reason we lick our fingers in order to turn the page is because moist skin has more friction. So how do we decrease moisture? You could use a drying powder. We can also use moisture wicking socks like polyester. Cotton tends to hold on to moisture. You can try experimenting with different sock materials aimed at either runners or hikers. For those of us who develop blisters between the toes because of toe-on-toe -toe friction, Ingenji makes running toe socks designed just for you. That finally brings us to tape. Tape works by decreasing the coefficient of friction so our skin can slide better. For this reason, be sure to use a tape that feels more on the slippery side. There are adhesives specifically designed for blister prevention, though any quality adhesive tape can work. Whichever tape you use, make sure it stays on well because if it falls off, it's likely to then bunch up and increase the pressure against your pressure point. If you're doing an adventure race where you're likely to get wet, try to find tape specifically designed to handle wet conditions. Also make sure to roll your socks on after taping rather than sliding. When I've been a race physician, it would make me cringe to spend half an hour taping up a badly blistered foot only to have the runner slide the sock back on. When you do this, if any of those tape edges catches the sock as you slide it on, it's likely to come off much faster. The time to decrease the friction is when you have an area referred to as a hot spot. A hot spot is a red and mildly painful area that indicates that the tissue is under stress. Essentially, they're precursors to blisters where the layers haven't started to separate yet. If you treat the hot spot, you can completely prevent a blister. And now, I'm going to show you how I tape feet. It's showtime. First, clean your feet so the tape has the best chance to stick well. One of the easiest and most common is the navicular bone. This is a bony prominence on the inside of your foot. Notice that I'm rounding the corners just like a band-aid. This helps significantly with preventing the tape from falling off. Use a piece of tape that is larger than your hot spot to help distribute the stress. Take care when laying the tape so that the edges lay flat with no ridges or creases. Now let's do the ball of the foot. Once again, always round all corners. 
The ball of the foot is rarely a straight line short of any tragic machete accident. For this reason, we have to curve the tape by using its elasticity. Because of this, we're going to end up with a crease which we can then snip off smooth so there's no ridge. Now let's cover the heel of the foot. I usually use two pieces of tape to cover the heel, though depending on what part of the heel you develop blisters at, you may only need one or the other. This video was not sponsored, but I do prefer Kinesio tape for the feet because it's smooth, it stays on well, and it's elastic. As you can see, the elastic properties of the tape make it much easier to cover the curves of the foot. However, it can be expensive. Another advantage of Kinesio tape is it often has a backing on it. This makes sizing and shaping much easier. Now I'm going to show you how to tape a toe. My initial strip is generally slightly less than the width of the toe. Because of the sharp turn of the toe, you generally will have to make a crease and then snip it off flat. For the second strip, you're going to use kind of a hot dog technique. This is much easier to visualize if you happen to be taping someone with sausage toes. Thank you so much for watching, and I know a lot of people have their own tips for blisters. There were just so many ways to treat them that I couldn't possibly put them all in this video. So if you have your own tips that you think really work, feel free to leave your tips for other people in the comments. This is actually the first video I have ever made, but I have a lot more planned on various medicine and science topics. If you like this and you wanna help out by simply hitting like, you can really help me get my channel started. And spoiler alert, I did a fellowship in wilderness medicine, so a lot of my videos are gonna have a focus on various outdoor and adventure health type topics. And if that interests you, you should hit subscribe below. I feel like I need some sort of cheesy sign off line. Thank you everyone, keep it lubricated. Oh, that's so bad. No, 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 let's not do that. Maybe I should just give up on that.